English out there. I wanted us all to know. Uh, Karen, this is being her last Sunday with us. Karen's a um, dear friend, former pastor at First Presbyterian, and you know, stepped away from there and has been visiting us and spending some time with us since that time. And uh, Karen Chucker moved to Richmond, and uh, she has a small parish. I think a small parish right outside Richmond, right, or on the outskirts of town. And uh, her husband Chuck, I believe, is going to be a curator of ideas or something at a museum. Or something. <laughs> science yeah. museum. That's exciting. That's a great science museum. We wish you well, and we're going to miss you, Kara, Chuck, and family. You found it? Yes. I think so. <laughs> Perfect. And the troops have different cultures in different troops. There's no exchange of ideas between them. And why does exchange raise living standards? Well, the answer came from David Ricardo in 1817. And here's a Stone Age version of his story, although he told it in terms of trade between countries. Adam takes four hours to make a spear and three hours to make an axe. Oz takes one hour to make a spear and two hours to make an axe. So Oz is better at both spears and axes than Adam. He doesn't need Adam. He can make his own spears and axes. Well, no, because if you think about it, if Oz makes two spears and Adam makes two axes, and then they trade, then they will each have saved an hour of work. And the more they do this, the more true it's going to be. Because the more they do this, the better Adam is going to get at making axes, and the better Oz is going to get at making spears. So the gains from trade are only going to grow. And this is one of the beauties of exchange, is it actually creates the momentum for more specialization, which creates the momentum for more exchange and so on. Adam and Oz both saved an hour of time. That is prosperity, the saving of time in satisfying your needs. Ask yourself how long you would have to work to provide for yourself an hour of reading light this evening to read a book by. If you had to start from scratch, let's say you, you go out into the countryside, you find a sheep, you kill it, you get the fat out of it, you render it down, you make a candle, etc., etc. How long is it going to take you? Quite a long time. How long do you actually have to work to earn an hour of reading light if you're on the average wage in Britain today? And the answer is about half a second. Back in 1950, you would have had to work for eight seconds on the average wage to acquire that much light, and that's seven and a half seconds of prosperity that you've gained since 1950, as it were, because that's seven and a half seconds in which you can do something else or you can acquire, acquire another good or service. And back in 1880, it would have been 15 minutes to earn that amount of light on the average wage. Back in 1800, you'd have had to work six hours to earn a candle that could burn for an hour. In other words, the average person on the average wage could not afford a candle in 1800. Go back to this image of the axe and the mouse and ask yourself... Okay. I can have lights back now. <clears throat> so, so what's going on exactly here? Ridley's lecture uh, is ultimately... He's, he's an optimist. He's talking about optimism. He's talking about the good that can happen when societies uh, trade with each other. Um, but I liked his is very simple analogy of the spears and the axes. So he kind of makes it clear that Oz is much better at making both spears and axes than his counterpart Adam. He doesn't really need Adam in any way. He can just go about applying his work and working himself to make more spears and axes. He could go on forever like that, and he doesn't really need Adam at all. But something happens when Oz and Adam exchange, when they enter into trade. And what Ridley showed real simply was that each one of them ends up saving an hour of time. Now, both of them actually, not just Oz, but Adam saves an hour of time too. What happens is, is that, that they, get, um, they get better, each one gets better at making whatever item that they're choosing to trade. So not only are they saving time, but they're actually getting better at making whatever it is that they're going to trade with each other. So go back to the parable for just a minute. Jesus is telling this story, and he's uh, telling us what the faithful servants did. So they immediately go out, and they put the master's resources to work. So if you think about, think about it this way, the, the talent, remember, it's not a unit of currency. It's a unit of exchange. The reason that the talent existed in, in Israel, the reason why they had this big bag of silver, was to measure different types of exchanges and to use it as a balance 
against big transactions. Think of it like equity, like you might have equity in your house. I mean, that's kind of what this talent is. So if you were to try and qualify exactly what's going on here, they didn't go out and put themselves to work making more spears and axes. What they did was they put the resources to work exchanging and trading. And in so doing, they were able to maximize the potential, the economic potential of the talent, of the resource. Mm -hmm. Now, it's also interesting when we stop and we really think about it, that the master does not expect his servants to go out and make something from nothing. Okay? They were each given, and this may be the key to understanding this entire parable, I think. They're each given according to their own ability. You see that, I think, in verse 15. So you think about it this way. The master di divides up his resources, each one according to their own ability or specialization. <coughs> There's a, um, Zig Ziglar does a lot of work in, in Christian communities, especially on economics. And he, he says something very interesting. I believe this is true. He says the greatest gift that we can give another person is not to simply give them our riches, but rather to reveal their own. And this is the reason that I think the master divides up the talents each according to their own ability. He was giving them his riches to manage, but in managing those riches, it was going to reveal in the servant their abilities, their specializations. This is what I, I'm, I'm good at. Now, if you, think, you stop and you think about it for just a second, if the master, if all the master cared about was making money, I want to make more money on my money, then he would have given all his talents to the most able person, right? That's what he would have done. That's what we do in business today. If we want to make more money, we find the most able person and we give them our resources to manage. But that's not what the master did. So he's not interested in making more money. God doesn't need more money. God doesn't need to be rich. I mean, he's already rich. He already owns everything. He's not out to make more. He divided the estate up each according to their ability. So he gives one five and he gives another two. You can manage exceptionally well. You're a good manager. He gives the other one one. I still have faith and confidence in you. I believe in you that you can manage this talent. And again, that wasn't a small amount of money. I like the way that Jesus describes God in this parable because Jesus is, is showing us a God who is wanting to reveal the riches inside of us, not just go out and make more money. That's, he's not interested in that. If he was, he would have given everything to the, to the most able servant. Instead, he's showing us that God wants to reveal riches that are inside of us. I also like the fact that he doesn't set anybody up for failure. He doesn't try to overwhelm the servants by giving them too much or more than they can manage. He gives each one according to their ability. Over the years, I've had opportunities to work with nonprofits, and I've been on nonprofit boards sometimes, and we've had these fundraising activities, and sometimes we've bitten off more than we could chew. We've taken more than we could handle in this fundraising activity, and what ends up happening uh, is that you get overwhelmed with the amount of money you need to raise. And inevitably, what happens when people feel overwhelmed, they begin to shrink back and draw back from the project. And oftentimes, uh, over the years, I've seen nonprofits who have failed in fundraising activities because they've bitten off more than they could chew. On the other hand, I've been on nonprofit boards that have had successful ventures. They took things in small steps, they set reasonable goals, and they achieved things. That makes you feel good inside when you achieve. And see, this is what God is after. And I love this about Jesus. I love the, the way that he describes God to us. Is that he doesn't overwhelm us with too many resources. He gives us what he believes we can handle. Because he wants us to have some successes. And what happens when the, when the one who got five has some successes? The master says, man, good job. You've done good in this. I'm going to give you some more. We'll, we'll keep working our way up here. Will have these kind of steps that will allow you to feel good about yourself. You'll discover the riches and the abilities, the specializations that are in you because of the way I've set this thing in motion. So since God is a resource and every resource uh, that we have is already his, 
I believe that what God gives us to manage is for our benefit. All right? That's important to understand in this parable. God doesn't give us these resources for his benefit. He's not out to make more. He's not the venture capitalist. He gives us these resources for our benefit. We're going to learn something. So the first two servants, they're excited about the opportunity. They go straight away. They put the resources to work. The third servant, though, unfortunately, we come to him. He's not faithful. He refuses to outsource God's resource. In fact, he does the worst thing possible with that resource. He buries it. The resource is hidden away, and it's not going to be a product of exchange. It's not going to create prosperity. It's not going to do anybody any good at all. Why would he do that? Why would he bury that resource? The two reasons that the story, I believe, gives us, and they're both equally important. First, by his own admission, he's afraid. He's afraid of his master, and he's afraid of himself. Those are the two things. He's afraid that he is going to fail, and that in his failure, his master will punish him. Those are two different kinds of fears, and both of them, I think, are worth looking at real quickly. David Seabury says that the fear of self is the greatest of all terrors. It is the deepest of all dreads. It's the most common of all mistakes. From the fear of self grows failure. Because of it, life becomes a mockery. Out of self-fear grows despair. 